Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? I see a number of people are, are dialed in or uh, watching this uh, through the platform. Welcome, everyone. My name is Esther Krofa, as I mentioned. I uh, serve as Executive Director of Faster Cures. We are in for a treat today. I'm so delighted to welcome everyone to this webinar focused on venture philanthropy in action. And what's most exciting about this webinar is that we're not just talking about an item or an issue theoretically, we're going to talk about it in practice. And we have fantastic um, example of how venture philanthropy has really come to life in, in a particular uh, disease area and then how all of you can learn from that. We look forward to this as a conversation. Uh, thrilled to have Michael Hund uh, join us from EV Research Partnership. Um, thrilled to have Alex Silver also joining us uh, from EV Research Partnership as well. To have Mark D'Souza from Wing Therapeutics as well as Daniel DeBoer, uh, who's the Chief Executive Officer at ProQR. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. We're looking forward to learning from your experiences and, of course, for the participants to ask their questions, because for us at Faster Cures, what we really want to see is how can we accelerate the development of treatments and cures. One way to do that is through this novel um, way of venture philanthropy and how that can fund and accelerate um, the developments of treatments. So look forward to having all of you share your perspectives and experiences. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Kristen Schneeman, who's the director of Faster Cures. I like to say the fearless leader of all things trained and venture philanthropy to help set the stage for our discussion today. Kristen. Um, great. Thank you so much, Esther, and welcome everyone from me to this um, uh, second train webinar of 2020. Um, as most of you on the line know, I think train is our initiative to encourage more entrepreneurial philanthropy in medical research. Uh, it brings together more than 100 nonprofit patient driven research funding organizations that share a desire to be more strategic and outcomes driven with their funding and other resources. Uh, it's been a platform for sharing information and best practices and for networking with other stakeholder groups. Uh, and the participants are large and small foundations with varying degrees of capacity and sophistication representing common and rare diseases. Um, the first webinar this year, which was on March 9th, feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, and it was in many ways. So much has changed for us all personally and professionally. Um, but despite the huge challenges we know all of your organizations are facing, we also know that you're driving your missions forward with the same uh, and maybe even more passion and creativity. Um, our topic in March was stories from the front lines of advancing therapeutic development for patients. And we featured three organizations in train that are doing that by deploying a variety of strategies. Uh, today, we're taking a deeper dive with another train organization, the, the Research Partnership, uh, and digging into the details of a particular strategy they've employed to great effect, which is venture philanthropy investing. Um, there's no widely agreed upon definition of venture philanthropy. Um, there is a broad definition that we have historically used at Faster Cures. Uh, which really speaks to the approach a foundation takes to its work, uh, a sort of business-minded approach that treats funding as an investment uh, rather than a traditional grant uh, and is looking for efficiencies uh, and oversight. Um, but today we're focusing on the strict or narrow definition of venture philanthropy, which is nonprofits that invest in for-profit enterprises to achieve both a social and financial return on their investment. Um, this is a discipline we have sought to support and enable for many years at Faster Cures, uh, and we have a renewed interest this year in uh, doing more analysis of new and emerging approaches uh, to venture philanthropy, impact investing uh, in the medical research space, uh, whatever term you'd like to use. Um, so we're excited to dive into the details of this model. I'm going to turn things over in just two seconds to Michael Hund who will be our moderator today, but I just, just want to review the usual housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, uh, you uh, probably are all aware you were muted on entry. Um, it's uh, always good to make sure you've muted your own line as well to ensure that um, uh, there's no audio feedback during the speakers. Um, thanks to those of you who submitted great questions um, in advance when you registered. Um, please feel free throughout the presentation to type questions in the Q&A box that you can access at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll do our best to get to as many of those as possible uh, after the panel discussion. And finally, the session is being recorded and will be available for review and sharing uh, hopefully within a few days. Um, so Michael, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Kristen, and thank you, Esther, and thank you to the Milken Institute's Faster Cures for hosting all of us today. My name is Michael Hun, CEO of EV Research Partnership, the largest global nonprofit dedicated to accelerating treatments and cures for epidermolysis bullosa, or EB for short. 
EB is a devastating and life-threatening genetic skin disorder that affects children from birth. At EBRP, we leverage the innovative business model of venture philanthropy, which we will be discussing today, to put speed into healing EB. Since we began in 2010, we have raised more than $40 million to fund more than 80 research projects, all under a venture philanthropy model, leading to 15 times the amount of clinical trials today at more than 30, including for the first time ever, three phase three clinical trials. While this makes us very hopeful that our first approved treatment for EB is on the horizon, we will not stop until we show the world how cures are found. It is my absolute honor today to be hosting an esteemed panel to discuss Venture Philanthropy in Action, a case study of EB Research and ProQR. I welcome as part of the panel, Alex Silver, Chairman of EB Research Partnership, Daniel DeBoer, the CEO of ProQR, and Mark DeSouza, the Chairman of Wings Therapeutics. So why don't we jump right in and start right at the beginning, starting with you, Alex. Can you tell us a little bit about how the Venture Philanthropy model was born at EB Research Partnership? Absolutely. First, Michael, I want to thank both Esther, Kristen, and the entire team at the Milken Institute and Faster Cures. You've been a champion in this area, and it's a real privilege to work with you in this and in the other ways that we have together. So to answer your question, Michael, let's first start with the definition of venture philanthropy. EB Research Partnership defines venture philanthropy the following way. We invest in projects. Those projects develop therapies and create intellectual property that we de-risk. And in return for doing that, we participate in any type of financial return. That's it. It's that simple. We help de-risk intellectual property. We simply ask to participate. And the premise behind that before directly answering your question is that the traditional nonprofit model is broken. It's broken because it's seasonal, it's cyclical, it's driven by tax policy. And every year, as many of the people on this webinar know, we have to fill the bucket again. There's no you know, subscription basis to our business. So the premise of this is rejecting the status quo. It's the idea that there is no other sector in the world that de-risks early stage intellectual property and simply hands off its financials to the next party. I, I challenge you to think of one. Anyone on this webinar, please tell me. It just doesn't exist. You know, the, the whole premise of the nonprofit, and we, we those in our organization around are, are sick of hearing this, nonprofit is a tax status. It's not a business model. It's a tax status. Our business model, like the others on this call, are to treat and cure the conditions that you are faced with. We have a tax advantage revenue line and the luxury of reinvesting our profits into that. But we do not exist not to make a profit. We exist to treat and cure EB. So any of those people who are listening to this venture philanthropy is the evolution, in my opinion, of both philanthropy and the for-profit sector. And that means, in part of that, you are rejecting the status quo that has existed for years, and you're finding like-minded partners, like those in Mark and Daniel, who you hear from, about how we can work together to do this. Now, to directly answer your question, this, like many other programs of success, was born out of a mistake. The first project we funded early on, when it was just a very small nonprofit, before we grew to the size we were, we funded that helped attract uh, we funded uh, intellectual property that wasn't getting funded, that was peer reviewed for a number of reasons. Sometimes things don't get funding just because they don't. That attracted uh, venture capital and ultimately was sold to a commercial party. And there were many dollars that were passed around and changed hands, yet though we were the validating capital behind it, we received none of that. And I sat there and scratched my head and said, this is truly insane. This is, this is not only insane, it's absurd because not, not only as a small rare disease nonprofit, and those on this call know there are 7,000 rare diseases that affect 10% of our population. It's 32 million people. Problem is the denominator. That denominator is huge, 7,000. So how do you solve those problems? You need capital when you're in the smaller groups like we are. So in this case, we looked at it and said, that's not going to happen. Imagine the first founders of any company that you know of simply saying, you know, I did this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand off my economics to the next party. So we learned from that, and that was the launching of our program which I'll go into uh, later on, kind of the specifics, um, that developed from that moment that day. And since then, with every university, with every for-profit, public or private company, we, go, we operate by the guidelines that I described. We will help de-risk this, which by the way, is for the for-profit party's interest because they now know what they're investing in has been de-risked. In return, we want to participate financially in the name of the nonprofit. To be 100% clear, there are no, there's no one on our board, our executive committee, 
who, when EBRP is investing, participates. It's all in the name of the nonprofit to fund further research in the future. Uh, you mentioned this is an interesting concept, right? The idea of being born from a mistake, and certainly at EBRP, there's been an incredible amount of lessons learned over, over the last decade. You know, thinking back on some of those, those lessons learned and the evolution of the model, what are some of the key factors you think are important for a successful venture philanthropy program for nonprofits? Yeah, uh, fantastic question. So I've kind of broken it down into what I'd say are five key things. One is know you're going into this, and I said it before, rejecting the status quo. You are going to be, you know, to, to use as many trite phrases as I can at once, pushing the boulder up the hill. But I would say the, the way to think about the mindset is this is very much a beg for forgiveness, not ask for permission mindset. We are making the rules of the road, and that's a really good thing to do because this isn't necessarily standard yet. You will get a lot of pushback, understandably, because inertia in itself and the way things have been done before creates just the natural resistance to it. So know that it is going to be something that you're going to have to convince many people of, and hopefully along the way, find some like-minded individuals like those on this call who want to help advance causes in the way business models evolve. That's number one. Number two, whatever you're funding has to have IP that can be patented and monetized. In any of these things to have commercially sustainable solutions, you need to be, have them commercially sustainable. It's, you know, it's self-fulfilling. So you have to have products and therapies that can be monetized and the correct intellectual property around them. You also, along those lines, have to have a market. Many of you know your own markets, but think about the, the people you serve. Some of them are smaller, some of them are not. What you do is you help the for-profit partners understand the market, the size of it, as well as how they can make this commercially sustainable, because that is key to this. Three, if it's possible, it's better to be one of the bigger nonprofits in your space than smaller. Simply speaking, as a larger nonprofit in EV Research Partnership is the largest in its space and enables you to usually negotiate the best terms. This is you know, standard in business as well. Uh, if possible, it's not 100% necessary, but it'll make your life easier. Four, you need to have expertise in investing and in, on your board, whether you directly or have advisory, both on a, uh, in investing and how to structure investments, as well as strong legal advice. If I woke up tomorrow and said, I want to be an Olympic diver, I could stand on the diving board, but it doesn't mean I have the experience to do so. So anyone who's interested in doing this, you may not have the skill set of structuring early stage venture investments, but you can look into your network and find somebody or Faster Cures can help you find somebody who's done later stage venture work, private equity work, and so forth, and they will be key to doing this. Similarly, along the legal lines, you want strong legal counsel. We can talk a little bit about what that means, but people who understand what for-profits want uh, and help treat and understand your problems in structuring your deal. And last but not least, flexibility. I know this all comes from a place that sounds like you need to have A, B, C, D, and E. And by flexibility, I mean, you have to be flexible on whether you're gonna be working with universities, which are also nonprofits, for-profits, public companies, private companies, you have to be flexible on how you want to structure this. Do you want to have an equity stake in the company? Do you want to have a guaranteed return on investment? Do you want to have some other mechanism? And that flexibility is what's going to enable you to problem solve such that each party who's part of this long chain of things that need to align for this to work, you can help facilitate that. So think about all of those key things. I'm happy to go farther into any of them uh, if uh, during Q&A or at any other point during this call. Oh, this is excellent, Alex. Okay, so now we have five success factors. Let's look for a moment on the other side of the equation. What are some pitfalls that nonprofit organizations should be on the lookout for as they build their venture philanthropy programs? Yeah, I divide those pitfalls into to three key things. One, just get used to hearing this isn't what nonprofits do and kind of smile, try not to roll your eyes and explain to them, actually, this is exactly what nonprofits do. Nonprofits are here to solve problems. We are businesses like any other business, and we are going to run our business as efficiently and as effectively as possible to run to solve our problems. And you will hear that a lot. Number two, when dealing in the nonprofit world with, with universities, you're often working with tech transfer offices. Have patience. They really do want to do the right thing for the university, but this is new to them, and you will encounter people who you are constantly convincing as to why this is different than history has. And they're used to doing things a certain way. And number three, on the for-profit side, get used to the fact that there will be some wonderful actors out there. And there will be some who will look at you and say you're an unsophisticated nonprofit, so therefore we'll try to take advantage of you. 
So it's a combination of having your antenna up, but also looking for the best in people and knowing that this isn't something that people simply accept. You are, you are driving change. And before, I just want to hit one other thing, Michael, which is as you all think about building or have a venture philanthropy program, you think of it because it can enhance the revenue stream of the organization, increase your assets. And in theory, it should. You know, this is early stage medical research. And if you are funding a lot of projects, kind of like a venture portfolio, a lot of them won't work. Some of them will, and they could have a great return. But the real secret behind venture philanthropy, we at EBRP believe is the case, is you're actually not thinking about money as much as you're really back solving for the asset that can't be replaced. And that's not money, it's time. You know, if you think in these rare diseases that the average duration of life is shorter than usual, and by taking this mindset, you can be funding any commercial mindset towards development, R&D, clinical trials early on. And we proved in a case study, this reduced a time frame in one project from seven years down to three and a half. That gave everybody living in our constituency three and a half years of time back to their life. So when you're thinking about this, think about that. That is the key thing. Yes, some of these things will pay off. A lot of them won't because it's early stage medical research. But that's really the, the secret weapon here in venture philanthropy. Thank you, Alex. And look, now that we have a framework, which I hope was helpful to all those on the line, I'd like to get us into the case, the real world example, seeing this framework in action. So, so to prime this discussion, you know, can you walk us through how EBRP sourced the opportunity to enter into a relationship with ProQR? Absolutely. So EB Research Partnership does a call for grants twice a year. It's built on an NIH model in which applicants apply and we, it's open to anyone, for-profit, non-profit, so forth. Um, and it goes in front of our scientific advisory board. Before this actual application, uh, one day on a trip to New York when Daniel DeBoer was on his way in New York for official business for ProQR, which is a publicly traded company, uh, we had the chance to meet and we had the chance to just you know, establish a relationship. So much of this is relationship driven. And he understood, given his personal experience, what it was like to be in a position of a parent of a child with a, with a rare condition and also trying to achieve change. So we had that existing relationship and then ProQR applied to our SAB. The SAB, again, is independent from our executive committee, scores two scores independently, and this was an exon skipping therapy that they deemed appropriate to fund. So our original kind of stage one of this was funding an agreement with inside ProQR, with EB Research uh, Partnership put in the funds, with terms that enabled a certain return if it were successful. It was, very, it was a very generous agreement, and in fact, ProQR was running it while we, um, while we were funding it. And ProQR, in all fairness, was also contributing funds and a lot of resources to this as well, so I don't want to make it seem like we were the only party there. That was kind of iteration one. Iteration two, which uh, I will obviously have Mark and Daniel speak about a bit, is then there was a change in which there was an opportunity to lift this program out of ProQR. We had about two to three weeks to do it. And that had to do with a number of corporate decisions within ProQR and enabled EB Research Partnership to establish a new company called Wings Therapeutic. And during that time, we had to have ProQR's co cooperation, funds from EBRP, and as well as additional funds, an entire management team that we had to bring together in a brand new company within about a two to three week time period. Thank you, Alex. And now our story comes to you, Daniel. And if you can tell us a little bit from your perspective about meeting EB Research Partnership and how that relationship evolved to a point of, of spinning out a new company. Yeah, happy to do so, Michael. So um, as, as Alex alluded to, uh, we met on a trip where I was in New York, and uh, I know that our organizations have been speaking for a while about what our technology could potentially do for EB. And as I was in town, we, we met up and we uh, uh, kind of had an introductory meeting where we, I think, connected very rapidly. That's where the relationship started. And yeah, you know, I think for all of us here on the call, but I think broader in our business, um, this all starts with passion. Right. In this case, it's the passion to do something for epidermal lysis bullosa, which is, you know, a devastating disease that that everybody would love to find a cure for. Um, so Alex and I connected, and um, we, you know, come from a fairly similar personal background, in the sense that we both have a child that's affected with a rare genetic disease, and we really understood what it's what what the the need was to get a drug for, for EB developed. And in this meeting, we brainstormed about what ProCure's technology could do, what 
EB, EBRP's mission was and how we could potentially uh, team up to really make an impact, an impact for patients. I think that was a, a really important meeting for us to establish the, the, the trust and the confidence and establish that relationship to uh, over the months and years to come build on in, uh, in getting this program off the ground. Thank you, Daniel. Let's get to a, a decision point that, that you and your team had to make. So the decision, you know, what, why did you pursue the path with wings as, a pro, as opposed to other choices you could have made as a company, other directions you could have gone into? Yeah, so, so maybe I'll take a step back. So I started my company about eight years ago now. Uh, this was pretty shortly after one of my children was born and diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. And I was an IT entrepreneur at the time, so I kind of took the time to figure out this whole biotech drug development uh, world. And uh, two years later, started this company. So we obviously started with developing drugs for cystic fibrosis. And for that, we licensed the technology, an RNA axon skipping technology that um, uh, could be applied to cystic fibrosis. But beyond cystic fibrosis, it could also be applied in other therapeutic areas. And one of those areas uh, what's the skin in terms of uh, uh, delivery to the skin um, to, to treat genetic diseases in, uh, in, in dermatology diseases. Um, so while we were doing our core business, which was uh, developing drugs for cystic fibrosis and, and uh, specific forms of genetic blindness, we had a bunch of passion projects, so to say. So we had people in our company that were really passionate about in what other therapeutic areas can we find ways to really make an impact in the lives of people that live with these devastating diseases. And one of those areas was EP. So we found in the lab um, uh, a hypothesis of how this technology could potentially help people that live with epidermolysis bullosa. And yeah, as it's such, a, such an important disease, um, we funded that for a while and yeah, optimized the preclinical technology, got it to a point where we approached uh, the start of clinical trials. And this was around the time when, when Alex and I first met. So um, we came together and we, we essentially asked EBRP for help. We said, this is to procure, it's a non-core project, but we realized there's high potential in there for patients and we would love to find a way to get this developed. It's not core to our, pro to our corporate strategy at Procure, but for, for patients, we want to see this move forward. So um, Alex and I um, brainstormed about how we could structure that, uh, what that could look like. And we landed on a, uh, on a structure where EBRP would co-finance the work and Procure would operationally take that into clinical trials um, to see if what we saw in the lab would actually translate to clinical trials. So we started those, um, we, uh, we funded those together. And as you know, time progressed, uh, Procure became you know, very occupied with the core activities of our company. And we came up on this, this, this moment where we had to make a decision for the EB program because the EB program was coming up on a interim analysis. And uh, this was an, you know, let's say intermediate look in the clinical trial that was being executed. And at Procure, the decision was made that um, we didn't really have the bandwidth to continue that trial beyond that interim analysis. So uh, at that point, I connected with Alex and said, you know, uh, this is such an important program. We have to find a way to continue it. Unfortunately, we cannot do that within Procure, but uh, let's get together and figure out a way how we can best drive this forward and make sure it gets to patients and has a real shot on goal. Um, so I think that led us to to exploring what ways could look like. I've, I've always believed that um, a dedicated approach is driving the most energy to a, certain, um, to a certain objective, in this case, developing this drug for EB. So the proposal was to form a company that would do nothing else than develop medicines for epidermolysis below, including this product as a lead product uh, and potentially other products that could follow down the line. And I think Alex, Alex really rapidly um, uh, got on board with that and got very excited about it um, and was able to, in indeed a very short time frame, um, uh, work with Procure to, uh, to see what this spin-out could look like. But not only that, through his network, he was actually able to bring in Mark D'Souza, who is a very experienced and uh, patient-focused uh, biotech entrepreneur uh, who, who was involved in the diligence subsequently 
and um, saw sufficient opportunity in that and, and took on a role as uh, CEO of that company, for which I think we're, we're all very grateful. Uh, so I think that um, that's that's how we came together and how we drove to um, to this decision eventually. Thank you, Daniel, which is which is a perfect segue. It brings us to the point of the story with Mark DeSouza. But before I get there, for those on the line that aren't familiar, you're saying two weeks to form and structure a new company is a fast amount of time? Yeah, that's uh, that's really, really short for any transaction. Um, for starting a company, it is, uh, it's uh, yeah, exceptionally short. Uh, I think, you know, under normal circumstances, that is typically unlikely to happen in that time frame. I think there were a lot of uh, things that came together here, but for a large part, this was driven by uh, uh, the professionality of EBRP. Um, so I think Alex mentioned this in his, um, uh, in his framework earlier in the, on the call. I think having a professional group like EBRP to partner with um, is crucial to make something like this happen. Because you know, there is a number of uh, uh, very important factors that need to come together to make a transaction like this happen. And you can only do that if all parties around the table are comfortable with what different structures are, what the important matters are, uh, and get to the get to the uh, the core of the, get to the essence of the conversation very rapidly, uh, and with that make it possible to uh, to do something like this on a short time frame. Thank you, Daniel. Excellent. And with that, I'm going to move around that table to Mark De Souza. Mark, you're a serial biotech entrepreneur. Given your experience, how did you approach the evaluation and, and formation of Room Therapeutics? Well, um, I think I'll uh, echo something both uh, Alex and Daniel said. It's, it's, it's all about trust and the people involved. Um, you know, two weeks is not a lot of time to inherit uh, uh, an, an asset that's had multiple years of development experience, um, a huge IP estate, um, and you know, a ton of scientific data. ProQR was already in the clinic when we were spinning out wings. So, you know, as you might imagine, there were, I don't even know how many thousands of pages of documents, but probably, you know, 100,000 pages of documents, you know, to go through. And it's impossible to do that in, 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 a, in a matter of weeks. So, so it, it's really um, the relationships that were built between EBRP and ProQR, the personal relationship that Alex and Daniel had, and the personal relationship that I had with Alex. I met Alex, I think, 11 years ago um, in the context of an EB company. Um, EBRP has funded a, a, a couple of my ventures in the EB space. Um, so when, you know, I think Alex texted me one day and said, you know, got to speak urgent. You know, I jumped out of my meeting and called him. And uh, two weeks later, um, there was an announcement that I was interim CEO of Wings Therapeutics. Um, and I can honestly tell you that we didn't, you know, uh, do the thorough diligence one would have done otherwise, uh, because this was all based on trust and relationships. But we, I was very fortunate to have a team of uh, people who are currently, uh, I'm, I'm currently executive chairman of Wings and the CEO of Wings and the CMO and the chief medical officer of Wings are people I've worked with uh, for 12 years or so. They know the EB space and we went through all the critical documents, the regulatory documents and the, um, all the clinical and non-clinical documents. And, really were impressed by the, uh, the data. You know, ProQR did a fantastic job um, developing a formulation of the drug. The, the, the drug itself is the core of ProQR's technology, these exon skipping drugs. So that was sort of the easy part, but to actually and, uh, to, to develop a topical formulation and to get into the skin space must have been more challenging for ProQR. But they really executed on that and when we looked at the data that was generated in pigs, that was generated in um, human skin equivalents to sort of represent patient skin, we were really impressed by the activity of the drug. And you know, that sort of translated all the way down to regulatory interactions and, and clinical, uh, the clinical trial. The commercial side was more um, uh, of a challenge, I think, for us. That, the first drug was for a very rare 
uh, mutation in the collagen 7 gene. But we figured out very quickly that that was really only specific to the recessive form of the disease. And for the dominant form of the disease, it was actually the most common mutation. So that helped us build the business case to say, okay, while we can initially fund the clinical trial with financing under a venture philanthropy model from EBRP, and there's another group that participated as well, can we then build the case to raise additional financing from traditional venture sources that we could complement perhaps with grants and, and, and other sources of funding that the people on this webinar are familiar with? And the answer to that was yes. So, you know, it, it took us uh, uh, a, a some, somewhat of a leap of faith to, to get started, but, uh, you know, as we learn more and more, more about the program, I think we are very excited about where we are and uh, we're still in the clinic at this point. Thank you, Mark. And, you know, at EBRP, we often see our, our role as this unifier, right? I mean, starting first and foremost with our shareholders, which is the patients and families that we serve but unifying that group with the needs of academic medical centers, with the needs of industry, mean biotechs, pharma, and even regulatory agencies. And while they all share the same goal, the needs are a little different. And, and you talked about this a little bit, but maybe we can dive a little bit deeper because you've had an incredible amount of experience with this, but, but how do you balance that, that need to have a sustainable profit with fulfilling the unmet medical needs that we often see in rare, in rare disease? Yeah, I mean, you have to sort of place your bets in some ways, you know, and I know Alex and I have had this conversation a few times and, you know, as a parent, um, you know, I can, and, and many of these organizations, I'm sure are started by parents or family members. It, it's tempting to sort of place multiple bets, um, some of them on uh, often futuristic technologies or uh, things that sound amazing. And, you know, I, I remember having this conversation with Alex a few years ago saying, you know, you really need to think about um, investing from in, in, in biotech or uh, venture philanthropy in, in uh, potential therapeutic drugs with, with the lens of when will this be on the market? What's the probability of success? Um, and, and, you know, I'm sort of maybe sorry to say this, but, you know, you don't want to invest in everything. You know, you really, I don't want to pick those carefully. And, and you have a team of key opinion leaders, you know, your usual academic researchers and scientists and clinicians, but also a team of drug developers because drug development, believe it or not, is a very different skill than research. And trying to figure out the probabilities of drug development success is really where you want to, um, you, you want to really assess that and, and put your money behind those that have a high probability of success. And there are a lot of things that I think the organizations have done to, to help us um, not just improve the probability of success. For example, patient registries have been invaluable in this space. Uh, having sequenced data, especially for the ProQR uh, drug that we uh, acquired, invaluable to help us determine and build a business case uh, for the drug that, that we're in the clinic with. Um, so, you know, it, it's, uh, the, the organizations play a huge role, not just in providing money, um, but the, the patient support. Um, and even now, we, you know, we're talking about outcome measures that family members know firsthand what's important to them. And FDA puts a lot of stock into the patient voice. So that actually also helps from the drug development point of view. So yeah, I, I think you know, pick your, you know, place your bets wisely is maybe the message there. Absolutely, thank you, Mark. A couple more minutes and then we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience. I have one question for Alex and then I have one question I'd like to direct at all three of you. Uh, but starting with you, Alex, look, a big piece of the recipe here is the legal component of this, right? A very, very important uh, piece of the puzzle. What advice would you give to nonprofits of, of how to approach um, legal structures, legal advice when entering into venture philanthropy. Yeah, thanks, Michael. You know, I will speak from EBRP's perspective, obviously, and in my experience in it, which is having strong legal representation is incredibly important. And that will depend upon the phase of the program that you're in and the phase of your venture philanthropy program. So if you're just working with academics, 
settings and universities, those are typically different agreements than if you're forming companies. So you can pick and choose your counsel depending upon where you are along that journey. But I will say one thing that made a big difference is this is a core area of investment. So I do recommend paying for good legal services. Pro bono is fantastic and greatly appreciated. But in this case, it's kind of like, think about being in a core investment to any program you are doing. If you, you know, were starting a restaurant, would you expect a pro bono food supplier? No, you would invest in the best food supplier. So in this case, I would say it's very important because there are a lot of good feelings around a lot of this. But when something goes awry, like anything else, the legal docs rules. So you want to make sure that the legal docs represent the interests of the nonprofit, which is what you are a director of, most importantly. Uh, and before you move on, I just do want to say two quick things. One is that these two individuals, Daniel and Mark, are, are really extraordinary uh, individuals because they balance both commercial and, and uh, commercial interests as well as kind of social good, for lack of a better term. And they focused it on rare diseases. And for those of you who are listening, they're unique, but at the same time, there are more of them out there than you think. So as you're going through this, you know, there is a lot of trust and that have facilitated this transaction, but that doesn't make this transaction unique and not replicable. What makes the part that is replicable is building the relationships with the people and finding them within the space that you operate in. Because believe me, they're out there. I met Mark 11 years ago. Did I ever think that Mark and Daniel and I, and I met Daniel a number of years ago, would, would be in this position? And Michael, when you joined EBRP. So it's really about building that audience, but they are out there. And this is just the basis of that. So whatever space you operate in, take the time to invest and look for those individuals because they will help you get to the goal that you need to ultimately achieve. Thank you, Alex. Well, I can see the questions piling up. So I want to get to the audience. Before I do that, I'm going to ask each of our, our panelists for perhaps your, your elevator response. But, you know, we have some of the leading medical research organizations in the world on this call with us today. And thank you again to the Milken Institute's Faster Cures for organizing this. You know, based on this experience, if you guys can give us a, just a quick soundbite, if you will, based on this experience, what's the best advice you could give to these medical research organizations? And I'm going to start with you, Daniel. Yeah, I would say establish the relationships as early as possible. Get to know the companies, get to know the people involved. Um, I think what Mark said is totally spot on. Uh, make sure that you not only have the scientific expertise, but also the drug development expertise, because they're two completely different beasts. And I think by uh, getting to know the companies, getting to know the initiators of the science and the, and the development, uh, understand what, what their roadblocks are, which may be financial, which may be executional, which may be access to patients, maybe outcomes, maybe uh, all the different matters, you can start to think about what a partnership could look like and how you can make the best, the, the, the biggest impact on their mission to help the cause that you're interested in. Well said. Thank you, Daniel. And over to you, Mark. Yeah, I'm also on the board of a couple of nonprofits uh, that are uh, one, one in the rare disease space. And I, I, I often see that uh, these boards tend to be all parents. And I encourage you to have a div you know, diversity of uh, um, you know, leaders on your boards, you know, drug developers, uh, commercial, uh, legal uh, expertise. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. And the last word over to you, Alex. Yeah, my advice would be do your homework, do everything that, that Daniel and Mark said. But when you step up to the plate, don't be afraid to swing. Do not be afraid to swing. Progress has never started with somebody starting with, may I do this? You may miss the ball, but then you just get back up at bat. You will eventually connect. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Alex, for this panel today. Uh, there are many, many questions that I'm sure we can't cover all today, but, but we're going to do our best to get to them. So at this point, I would like to thank the panel, conclude our panel formal session, and pass the mic over to Kristen, who's going to open it up for some audience questions. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Michael. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, appreciate it and appreciate all of you um, giving, us the, giving us the background on this um, extraordinary story. I also appreciated, Alex, your point, which uh, we did have some questions on about um, uh, it, it feels like um, a, a unique, uh, maybe not a unicorn experience, but a unique experience because of 
because of the personal relationship that you um, uh, have with both of these gentlemen. Um, uh, but I appreciated your point that that's not necessarily unique to this situation, that that's something that you can do as an organization over time is just to continuously be building relationships with the other uh, players in your space, whether they're for-profit, non-profit. Um, and then, you know, that creates a, creates a foundation for these types of things to come about. So I don't know if uh, any of you would like to address a question, a broad, very broad question about how, how can this sort of thing become more uh, regular, sustainable, scalable for small organizations? How do you all, how do you find opportunities and find one another? Krista, may I just jump in real quick? So EBRP in the last year has formed four companies. We've invested in public and private companies. ProQR and Wings is, is one example that was highly tangible with two individuals who are willing to share their experiences. But all of this is sustainable and replicable. The key is setting up the various pieces you need to do it. So you need to have the ability to have a call for grants. So you see a wide range of research coming through your organization, an independent group scoring them, the ability to have investment advice on your board and legal advice. And then obviously in this case, depending upon the stage of the company and the research, thinking about, sorry, stage of the research, which may be in a company or academic setting, thinking about the appropriate structure. So in the case of EBRB, EBRP, we had our call for grants, our second call for grants yesterday. Michael will know, but it looked like there were 20 something projects that came in and all at various different parts of them. Once they go, uh, parts of their life cycle. Once they go through our scoring mechanism, the ones that are approved, if they are in an academic setting, we will put them on the path to negotiate the things that are relevant for there. And I can go into specifics if the audience is interested because that's typically a royalty share. Then if they're not, if they're in a commercial setting, is it public or private? Well, if it's a public company, how does it think about the way they want to use EBRP's capital? If it's a private company, what is the easiest way to invest in it? That's why I said about flexibility. Are they doing a fundraising round? Maybe we join that. Maybe in certain cases, they like a guaranteed ROI. Uh, so it is, it is starts with the fact that you have an entire funnel set up around only doing and funding projects like this and making sure that you have the ability to answer them and structure for each setting in which someone applies. No, yeah, great. I think if I may jump in, I think the concept itself is very generalizable um, across multiple different settings. And, you know, we've interacted and partnered with patient uh, research organizations in many different fields. And I think what we've seen is that's really important is um, that the organizations are real content experts. So they're really experts in their fields and um, know what they're talking about, understand the science behind it, under, understand the disease, understand the population, understand the needs of the patients, um, which you know, is crucial for a company to get involved with an, with an organization. I think, um, Beyond that, uh, it's important to be flexible because every company uh, will be at a different time point in their life cycle. And depending on where they are in the life cycle, the structure, the structure needs to be such that it's easy for the company to accept the, the, the funding in that structure. And that will be different for every situation. So I would recommend everyone to you know, think about what it would ideally look like for you in terms of structure. Uh, there should always be a return on investment for uh, for the the, the not-for-profit organization when there is success in the program. Um, but be flexible on how to structure that, because indeed, as Alex said, in some cases equity may, may be the preferred route. In some cases, there may be a fixed ROI or um, a royalty mechanism or uh, what have you. And I think it's important to make the the, um, uh, the the threshold for the company as low as possible to get involved, because it really uh, uh, helps to advance the mission towards uh, the topic that you're, you're interested in. If, if I can, um, you know, I, I sort of interpreted the question a little differently, that how, how do you actually find people like Daniel and me? Um, and, you know, I've actually, uh, you know, wound up doing um, a venture philanthropy deal at a patient organization uh, conference. And, and many of the biotech partnering conferences, bio, the JP Morgan conference, actually have now rare disease partnering forums. And the usual suspects in the rare disease space are all there. And if, if you don't, don't have a chance to meet them there, reach out to them. And I think I'm always happy to hear from 
people with some obscure disease I'd never heard of because that's what I enjoy doing. And the second thing maybe quickly is, I think one thing EBRP has done well is keep their grant uh, process really simple. Alex, you said, you know, you follow the NIH process. You know, in terms of peer review, maybe, but it's a six page proposal, right? Keep it simple. Um, great. I, I was going to, uh, I should say, I, I want to invite Michael. Uh, you should obviously consider yourself part of this conversation as the day-to-day -day, <laughs> uh, leader of the of EB Research Partnership, so feel free to chime in as well. Uh, if that's okay with Alex, I assume it is. Of course. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> I, I think the only thing I'd, I'd add to um, what's already been said, I mean, you think about what is sustainable and, and how you can build your organization. Look, I, I think all of us as nonprofit leaders and medical research organization leaders, you know, this is a year where you throw out the old playbook and you write a new one. Um, you know, it, it, all organizations have been hit. You know, are you always going to have wins with venture philanthropy? No. Is it predictable? Absolutely not. Can you budget and plan for it? No. However, it does give you the opportunity to have a new sustaining possible revenue line. And not only does that help the growth of an organization as we scale and we do things like build companies in the same way that you did, you would with a for-profit company, building out teams, it provides you the runway to do that. But you know, what we found as an organization is this is a message that resonates with donors and supporters in the philanthropic community. You know, being responsible, not only for every penny, but, but the ability to say, not only are we gonna take your funds and then rapidly accelerate and advance research, but we're looking for ways to create multiples off your original donation. So I think it's, it's sustainable in, in multiple different facets of the model. Great. Um, can I, I, um, I think both uh, Daniel and Alex have addressed the question of what, what terms um, might apply to uh, in, a, in a deal like this, in a situation like this, and you may or may not be free to talk about the specifics of this particular um, situation. And, and I understand that um, the answer broadly is it depends <laughs> um, whether you go uh, the equity route, the royalty route, um, whether you take a seat, I don't know if taking a seat on a board um, is something that you entertain, but are there any kind of broad rules of thumb or uh, guidance that you can give um, organizations about uh, when, when those you know, different scenarios might be most appropriate? So, so from an EBRP perspective, when we form new companies, we are an equity holder in those companies. Um, that is the new company model. In the case of Wings, ProQR is an equity holder, as are we, as is the management team, as are the other investors. And then there is some other royalties that are tied to milestones that ProQR will receive. That's not uncommon as a structure. So I'd say in forming a new company, you are most likely as an organization, the easiest path and the most, the, probably the path that has the greatest value potential for the organization is to be an equity holder. With that being said, EBRP does not take board seats. I would highly recommend that you think through this for a number of reasons. The number one reason is we don't want to show preference. We are looking to be capital and recruit management teams to run the businesses. We are not in the business of drug development. We are de-risking creating these companies and then hopefully raising more capital around them. Number two, it's not our expertise. Uh, the day-to-day -day management. Number three, we're spread pretty thin. And I'd say on a very practical matter, as we've learned, it also can, uh, depending upon certain rights uh, that you may or may not have, they may have to be consolidated into your financials, which creates a lot of noise for donors and for GuideStar and those other things. You don't want the tail to wag the dog. It's really the, the former more than the latter, which is we look to capitalize these companies and empower entrepreneurs like Mike uh, Mike, like Mike, sorry, Mike, Mark, um, and Daniel, whose ProQR team has stayed supportive and really, you know, work with them to bring the community in that direction. So that's number one. Number two, if you're working with universities, to answer this correctly, the way that we've really found it works over time is some type of royalty share. And the general formula that has worked for EBRP is, say you're working with University X, that there is a royalty sliding scale based on the percentage of money that EBRP has funded with some type of limitation. So if EBRP is 100% of the funding, which often happens in rare disease, the university still participates, so the university has an incentive to do so. So that's kind of the, the rough sketch to it. It's much more simple in that scenario. And then last but not least, I think Daniel hit it, now hit it right on the head. Certain companies will say, we want to give a guaranteed ROI, which means if we put in $5, 
you can at max get 25 back or whatever it is. It could be a three to one multiplier, 10 to one. It all depends on the negotiation and others will be want to tie you to milestone payments. So these are all the tools you'll have, which is why I will return to, if you go down this path, whether you or someone on your board or whether Faster Cures can connect you with somebody who has experience in structuring later stage venture and private equity deals, this will be bread and butter to that person. And that person will be very valuable because they will make it the path, they'll follow the path of least resistance for your corporate partner, which makes it easy for ProQR then to back EBRP in forming a company like Wings. Yeah. yeah, maybe to add to that, I think across the board, we've seen in uh, transactions with, uh, with, with, with patient focused organizations that there's roughly two ways to do it. The easiest way is to say we tie the investment to the program and there is a guaranteed ROI if we get the drug approved. So that means you know, we're, you're investing, we're investing. If in a number of years from now the drug gets approved, we'll pay you back the investment you made with a, let's say, three to five times uh, return. So I think that is pretty common for probably investments up to 15 or $20 million. I think anything above that is typically structured more, uh, you know, with an equity structure and with more influence. I think on the board seats, you probably want to stay away from that, as Alex said, also for the company to not make it too heavy, because that will typically be uh, a condition for the company that's hard to accept. And I think you want to make sure that your, um, your investment moves the program forward as soon as possible and don't lose too much time in uh, figuring out the details because the company is incentivized, right? If you uh, help them bring that program forward and the program succeeds, then the company meets their objective. So I would focus on uh, getting it funded, do it in a fair way so the, the not-for-profit should always participate once there's a success but focus it on um, you know, getting it there with um, the, the least resistance. Uh, I'll, I'll just ask Mark if you have anything to, to add I'll there as well. One quick point, as an entrepreneur, you know, and, and generally running very small companies, private companies, I'm agnostic actually as to what that return on investment takes. The one thing I am sensitive to is, is sort of any sort of early milestone going back to the venture philanthropy investor because the cost of capital is so high, typically for early stage small companies. So equity, royalties, you know, uh, a fixed ROI upon uh, clinical proof of concept or approval, all that makes sense. So, and you know, it, I think there's a lot of flexibility to structure things differently. Kristen, I add one more thing, which is one thing that we've adopted at EBRP that, that Michael and I focus on in our negotiations is, and Mark hit this, made me think of cost of capital. Remember from your nonprofit hat, you have two mandates. It's the, it's the social mandate and then the venture philanthropy return mandate. Don't ever let the return mandate govern the other. It doesn't mean you don't negotiate hard, but we don't actually look to be the most expensive cost of capital. In fact, we would like our management teams to have more equity than less. We want them to focus on that, that should it be successful, they are making a great financial return and feel that we have given them not only a fair deal, but maybe even a better deal than some of the traditional venture firms, because that is a win-win scenario. Our goal is to treat and cure EB. This augments our resources, but we never forget the first goal when structuring these things. So I would keep that in mind. This is The moment this becomes adversarial, you're trying to eke out every last dollar, you've lost sight of the mission. This is to create and augment your model and also create a structure that is an incentive for people like Mark and Daniel and companies to work with you in doing that. Yeah. Great. Well, I think that's a great, I'm sorry that we have to end this conversation now because uh, we've got some folks who need to be in other places in a few minutes. Um, but um, uh, I think that's a great note to end it on. We have so many questions and they're still coming in, I can see, um, that uh, uh, we won't be able to specifically get to. But um, we do have, uh, first of all, this uh, conversation will be recorded. It is being recorded and it will be shareable. Uh, afterwards, um, we have an intention not only to write a brief summary of this webinar, but um, to uh, do a, uh, write a longer piece um, about this particular model and a lot of the issues, broader issues that have been raised here. And in that process, we can endeavor to uh, capture and answer a lot of the questions that we weren't able to get to um, specifically here today. But I want to thank um, all four of you so much uh, for joining us today and, and giving, us a, giving us a window into um, the relationships that you've established and the, and the great um, uh, progress that you've been able to make and we wish you uh, continued great progress. 
Um, so thank you and thank you everybody for, for joining us today on the webinar. We, we appreciate your appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you, Kristen.